Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 152. I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and I am back from London, England, where I was speaking at the Who Do You Think You Are live conference, and I brought back some gems for you for this episode, which I'm really excited about sharing. Uh, I got to spend about a week in England this time around, and got to do some touring with my friend Janet Havorka. She's the owner of Family Chart Masters. Now, we went to Windsor Castle, which I've always wanted to see, and it definitely did not disappoint. You know, one of the things that stood out to me as uh, we were going through the castle and, and wandering the halls, and it's it's just amazing, was it's really all about family history. I mean, we're talking one big family, but um, just steeped in history. And boy, we could all learn a little something from the, the castles of Britain. You know, as you walk down the halls, the family history is everywhere. And um, more specifically, really in the details. That's what really struck me. Uh, it wasn't just, there's a portrait here of great-grandfather, and there's a portrait there of, you know, a king from 200 years ago that is uh, somebody on the family tree, but it was all the little details, um, the things that represented the various people, things that meant something to people in the family, and all of the care that truly the current royal family puts into taking care of it, really being the caretakers, if you will, of not just their own family history, but of course, British history that goes far beyond their own family tree. Um, it just really struck me that, boy, I want to make sure that when people come through my home, that they have this sense of who we are as a family, and that we've paid a close attention to the details so that uh, it's more than just a portrait, but it's really information and story and things to inquire about and to pass on to the next generation. I, I don't know if I'm saying that quite right, but boy, it really hit me. And I, I wish I could give you some specific details of, of some of the details that struck me, but it was everything from, oh, this was somebody's particular crest or this portrait has hidden in it, you know, something that meant something to this individual in the family. I mean, just incredible uh, details everywhere you looked. So anyway, needless to say, I was very impressed with Windsor Castle. Really, really enjoyed that. I was a little tired that day. I literally had just come in from my 10-hour flight from the west coast of the U.S. and got in. They picked me up and we took off for Windsor Castle and we hit that. So by the time we wrapped that up and I got back in the car, I think I'd been up for like 24 hours. (laughs) So I'm sure I was a blithering idiot at that point, but I had a really good time. But really, the highlight of this trip, uh, for me, in addition to the conference, was going to Jane Austen's house in Chawton, Hampshire. Now, I am a total Austenophile, and I just soaked in the nooks and the crannies of her home, you know, the home where she lived with her sister, Cassandra. It was fantastic, you know, walking up and seeing the little desk where she worked on her books, you know, like Pride and Prejudice and Emma and Sense and Sensibility. It really was something. I, I felt like I was in the house that, you know, you see in A&E's Pride and Prejudice. It was very much, it looked very similar, actually. Uh, not quite as grand as that house, but uh, it was just a wonderful experience. And then when Janet and I finished up that tour, we headed over for tea at Cassandra's Cup Tea Shop right across the street, named for uh, Jane Austen's sister, Cassandra. And where they have hundreds of teacups hanging from the ceiling. China teacups. Absolutely every single one of them was different, glorious, and where I had the very best bowl of tomato soup I've had in my entire life. Now, tomato soup is not usually what I think of when I think of a food that thrills me, but this was unbelievable with big crusty bread, and it it absolutely had to have been homemade. It was wonderful. So you can check them out, cassandrascup.co.uk. What an adorable little shop. And um, boy, what a, what a nice change sometimes from going to lunch here in the U.S. Oftentimes going to lunch in the U.S. is like, you know, get it done, right? <laughs> we 
got in there and we start talking and nobody ever comes and says, here's your check. You're done. We could just spend three hours and we'll leisurely enjoy the afternoon and visit. And you could kind of see both of us just halfway through the meal, taking a deep breath and going, let's just relax. (laughs) We don't have to go anywhere and they're not pushing us out the door. It's really, really nice. Oh yeah. And there was a genealogy conference to go to. Uh, yes. Who do you think you are live lived up to all expectations? Once again, this time around, Janet and I had a booth and I also, of course, taught classes. I taught classes this time on Google search and using your iPad or your tablet for genealogy. The classes were sold out. People were lined up around the walls. Uh, the really the overall turnout for this event was just incredible. I haven't seen the final numbers, but the word at the time was we were looking at well over 12,000 people over that three-day period of the event. So it was really something. And here's my little genealogy story from Who Do You Think You Are Live. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, then you might remember me telling you about my first trip over to London to speak at Who Do You Think You Are Live and how after one of my presentations, several of my husband's distant English cook cousins met up with us and we sort of had an impromptu family reunion. It was right upstairs in the expo hall. Well, one of those in attendance was Louise Cook. Now it's Cook without an E and she married my husband's cousin Peter, very distant cousin Peter. Now I know it gets a little confusing because here we are. We had Louise Cook and Lisa Louise Cook, one with an E, one without But anyway, Louise and I, uh, we have stayed in touch on a regular basis, and we met up again this year at the conference. Now, she found me after one of my classes, and we got a chance to visit and and, uh, have a cup of tea, and then she told me how that she was going to help out at one of her friend's society's booths. So we're walking back. We went back downstairs. We're walking back. You know, she's following me to my booth. And I look up and she looks up and she just laughs when we get to my booth because the Lincolnshire booth was right next to ours and there was her chair. So can you imagine if we had not already met that Lisa Louise Cook and Louise Cook would have been sitting right next to each other at this conference, not knowing that our husbands were related by way of their third great grandfather. Can you imagine? So the moral of the story is next time you sit down at a genealogy conference, be sure to introduce yourself to those next to you because you never know who you might be related to. Also, while at the conference, I got a chance to talk to some of you. I was so excited how many listeners stopped by the booth to say hello. And I've got a couple of them I'll be introducing you to here on the show in just a few minutes. Also had a wonderful opportunity to sit down and talk to the woman who identified King Richard III, Dr. Turi King. She uh, is the geneticist who ran the DNA testing on Richard III, who they recently found under a car park in Leicester, England. So uh, that is coming up here shortly, too. But first of all, we've got several other items to talk about in the world of genealogy. And one of them is, well, let's see here. Right now, I'm recording. It's March of 2013, and it's it'll be just around the corner that the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree is going to be here. And they have just announced that Dr. Spencer Wells, Ph.D., is going to be speaking at the conference this year. Now, they are holding a Family History and DNA Genetic Genealogy in 2013 one-day conference the day before the main jamboree begins. And, of course, they have grabbed some speakers that are among the most highly respected and knowledgeable professionals in the DNA and genetic genealogy world. The opening session is going to be conducted by Spencer Wells, Ph.D., an explorer in residence with the National Geographic Society. He leads the Genographic Project, which is collecting and analyzing hundreds of thousands of DNA samples from people around the world. And Dr. Wells' presentation is going to be called The Genographic Project and the Rise of Citizen Science. And also, they are going to have as their luncheon speaker, Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., Ph.D., who's been here on the podcast. He's the director of W.E.B. Dubois Institute for African-American 
Research at Harvard University. Dr. Gates is an American literary critic, educator, scholar, writer, and filmmaker. You probably know him from his PBS series, Finding Your Roots. He also did African American Lives, Faces of America, and Oprah's Roots. And, of course, explored family histories of a number of famous people through the use of DNA. So uh, I will have links to the Southern California Logical Society Jamboree blog where you can learn more, you can get registered, and they've also announced their full slate of speakers. I am really proud to be among them, and I'll actually be playing a special role this year in, I believe it's the Friday Night Banquet. They are going to have some of the producers from Who Do You Think You Are, the television series, and I'm going to be moderating that evening's event. So it's just going to be a ton of fun. It always promises to be, and they always deliver. You can learn more, again, about the Jamboree at genealogyjamboree.blogspot.com. Now, do you know any young genealogists who would love to go to the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree? You can encourage them to apply for a $500 cash award and free conference registration. The Suzanne Windsor Freeman Memorial Grant Committee is now accepting applications for its 2013 Student Genealogy Grant. Now, they did this last year. The SCGS Jamboree is going to provide the grant recipient with a free three-day registration. Genealogists between the age of 18 and 25 who have attended school in the last 12 months are eligible to apply. The recipient must attend the 2013 SCGS Jamboree in Burbank, California to receive the award. Now, certainly, Jamboree is the perfect place for a young person to further their genealogical learning. And uh, it's a wonderful place to make professional connections and uh, really hear from some of the top folks in the genealogy industry. You can get complete details and encourage those in your life who are between the ages of 18 and 25 who might have an interest in genealogy to apply. They can get their application materials from the Family Curator website. And the application deadline is coming up soon. It's March 18th, 2013 at midnight Pacific Standard Time. So I will have a link in the show notes for you so that you can get all the information and hopefully encourage other young folks to get involved in family history. Now, I got another press release here that I think that you may be interested in. Find My Past. It's a hit UK television series. Uh, It's now available to view via findmypast.com. Find My Past is now entering second season as a popular TV series, and it links living individuals to real historical events found in their family tree. And now findmypast.com is the only place in the U.S. where you can watch the show. So you can register on findmypast.com for free, and you can watch Find My Past episodes that aired in the last 30 days at no cost. And if you've missed an episode or you want to watch your favorites again, Find My Past subscribers can watch all the episodes for an unlimited time. Every episode is going to be available to watch on findmypast.com a week after it airs. Now, to tell you a little bit more about this series, if you're not familiar with it, they unite ordinary members of the public with their ancestors. So these aren't necessarily celebrity profiles. These are everyday folks. And each week in the new 10-part series, they reveal how three people are related to someone from a significant historical event by searching the ancestry records on Find My Past. They follow their journey as each person discovers which of their ancestors played a role in modern history. And it's interesting because this format is one that I know a lot of people in the U.S. said, oh, I wish they would do that uh, with who do you think you are over here. I think that there's a real, and I think it's really interesting that they managed to kind of co- keep the celebrity aspect of this active by making it more of a celebrity in history than a current day celebrity and that everyday folks can make that connection back to somebody who played some kind of a pivotal role. doesn't have to be the King of England. It could be anybody who maybe was notorious in some way in the past. At the end of every episode, they unite the participants that are related and reveal how each person's family history is connected to this monumental world history event or person that they've been profiling. So examples would be the, um, the Titanic or a connection to the World War I Christmas truce, or the Great Fire of London. The show is hosted by Chris Hollins of BBC Breakfast, 
Watchdog and winner of Strictly Come Dancing 2009. The hit UK t- television series is now available for the first time to watch online, exclusive to Find My Past registered users. So if you want to check out that show, and particularly if you're here in the US and you'd like to see how they do it over in the UK, you could head to the show notes and I've got links for you there to lead you over to watch Find My Past on findmypast.com. And just around the corner, of course, is Roots Tech 2013. And I am really looking forward to this. I think it starts up here just around the corner, March 21st, 2013. And they have announced who the keynote speakers are. Let's see here. Introducing Thursday's keynote speakers at Roots Tech. They're going to be having Dennis C. Brimhall. He is the president and CEO of Family Search. Sid Lieberman, he's a nationally acclaimed storyteller and author and an award-winning teacher. And D. Joshua Taylor, of course, who is a business development manager at findmypast.com. And if you want to attend the conference, it's not too late. Who knows? Maybe you can just catch a plane, head on out there. It's going to be a lot of fun. I was amazed how many people I spoke to over in the UK at Who Do You Think You Are Live who were saying, oh, I'll see you at Roots Tech. It's really gained an international popularity. So I'll have a link to get you over there, or you can just head to rootstech.org. Okay, well, coming up next, um, we're going to hear from you, and we will do that over at the mailbox. Bring me a letter from my old hometown. Some jokes from my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter from that girl of mine Saying that he's longing for me all the time Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I bet he's glad but more than any other, a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my hometown. Okay, well, here in the mailbox, we've got a couple of emails from some of you, and the First one comes from Del Rey, who says, I've been listening to your podcast for over two years now, Genealogy Gems and Genealogy Gems Premium. All the podcasts are on my iPod, so I can listen to them over and over. It seems each time I listen to your podcast, I learn something new that I missed last time. Somehow, I missed the fact that you used to have a podcast called Family History Genealogy Made Easy. I'm going to be teaching a class to genealogy newbies in April. So I've been listening to these older podcasts to see what you shared with the beginners. You mentioned the show notes like you do in Genealogy Gems, which are always a lifesaver when I miss a web address or something. However, I can't locate the show notes for Genealogy Made Easy. If I Google the show notes, I get directed to the Personal Life Media website, which you worked with before. It says it's pretty sleazy now. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Personal Life Media. Um, It says, I hate even trying to search that site for your notes. Do they still exist somewhere online? And can you help me? Thank you for all you do for the genealogy world. All right. Well, I know a couple of you have written in about this, um, about where are the show notes? What happened to Family History Podcast? It's in a bit of transition right now. So we are no longer with personal life media for the very reason that you noticed. Um, they have gone a different direction in terms of their content, and it is certainly not one uh, that aligns with my show. And originally, the idea was they had a broad podcast network with a variety of shows and all different kinds of kind of like hobby topics. And they approached me and said, hey, we'd love to have you do this show. And so I thought, This would be a wonderful way to kind of create a a genealogy 101 type of uh, course in a podcast form. So we did that for a couple of years, and uh, I kind of felt like it kind of came to a natural conclusion, and we were at a point where then people would, you know, transition over to this show to continue on with their family history research. 
Uh, the problem is, is that over the years, their focus of their content changed. And, you know, it, it got more into other kind of, you know, relationship topics. Let's just call it that. And didn't really line up with me. So I told them several months ago that I wanted to call it a day. And uh, we, we had a good run, but they're going one direction. I'm going another direction. And that was perfectly fine with everybody involved. So they took the show notes down, but the iTunes feed is still up. We're still trying to figure out how we're going to do that. If there's a way to transition that over to me, or whether we're just going to have to take it all down and I will republish the show with a brand new iTunes feed. So if you've downloaded the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast in the past, hang on to those episodes until we get that done, okay? Because those are, that's really the only place you're going to get them at this point. But know that we are in the works of getting them republished, figuring out how to transition this feed or start a new one. And what that will mean is that you can then continue to access it through iTunes. And all of the show notes will be on genealogygems.com. So appreciate your patience on that. I am actually, it's been very nice to hear how much all of you enjoyed that show so much and, and still uh, get something from it. And I know a lot of you have been recommending that show to your friends and people at your society, because again, it was kind of a, you know, step by step, you could start with episode number one and really start building your family tree. And we had lots of great guests on that show as well. So don't worry, it's not going to go away completely, but it's in a little bit of transition right now. So bear with me. And I will definitely announce here on the podcast as soon as it all gets settled and those show notes are back up and running on the website. And I also heard from Gus. He wrote in to say, I listened to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 148. And here are my thoughts on internet ripoffs. He says, I have both a blog and a website. And my feelings are that if I put anything up there, people will steal anything and use it for their own use. I've copied myself from two books, one published in 1888 and another published in 1895. And I don't feel like I'm really stealing from these books. In the book from 1888, I gave credit to the original author, my ancestor, in the new book. And uh, what Gus is referring to is I think we talked about the fact that there's been some issues with the Cindy's List website and some concerns uh, on Cindy's part that maybe some copying happened uh, on another paid website. So uh, we talked about that in episode 148. In terms of copyright, you know, typically prior to 1923, you're fairly safe with most old books because... They typically are in the public domain unless somebody has taken the, the care and uh, time to renew the copyright. So probably you're not running into any big problems with that. If you want to learn more about copyright issues, um, I had a great guest on the Genealogy Gems Premium Podcast episode, Kath Madden Trindle. I think it's episode 14. I will double check and get that in the show notes for all of you. But certainly I think Gus makes a point, like it or not, and no matter how the law reads, when we put things online, we are taking a risk. But and if you think about it, if you live your life, you're taking a risk. <laughs> you're taking a risk. Somebody's not going to play by the rules or take advantage. I don't think that makes it okay. But um, I think in particular, if, if there's something that's really critical to us, either we have to have the funding to back it up to take it to court or we need to keep it off the web because it's amazing how much copying goes on so um interesting appreciate your feedback and your comments and ideas on that gus and dan also chimed in on this subject says when rock legend ronnie james dio died in 2010 i used his obituary as a starting point for genealogical research on his ancestry blogging about what i found at a blog called What I Have in Common with Ronnie James Dio. I think I'm saying Dio, right? <laughs> it's D-I-O. Two people contacted me politely requesting permission to reprint the information. So in my experience, people have been quite respectful of copyright. One of those people wanted to add my findings to the Hungarian Wikipedia page on Dio, increasing my reach as a blogging genealogist beyond my wildest dreams. And Dan, you're making a good point, which is when we do put stuff out there, even if people do copy it, we actually are getting more exposure. And how nice to hear that there are people who actually do contact you and ask for permission. That's the right way to do it. 
and uh, how nice that you're willing to share. And again, that just increases your reach as well and people getting back to your blog page. So boy, if we could all kind of work together in that kind of a way, I think things would be a lot nicer online. And uh, I got another email. This is from Brett, who wanted to get the word out on his genealogy blog. He says, I regularly listen to your podcast through iTunes, and I see that sometimes you feature blogs on your show. I've been meaning to write to you for quite some time now, and I'm hoping that you can let your audience know about my genealogy blog. It's called No Hoof Left Behind. It features a family history of the breeding family. I love that. You guys come up with the best blog names, I'm telling you. He says, our roots are specifically in the following areas, Wyeth County, Virginia, Overton County, Tennessee, Carroll County, Arkansas, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. So you can find Brett's blog at nohoofleftbehind.blogspot.com. He says, I've been researching my family for almost five years now, and I've written about 900 pages of stories associated with the family, including a double murder, which introduced me into the field of genealogy back in 2008. I got the idea to do a family history blog from one family member who said that it would be great if I would write about the process of discovery that I've been going through all these years. Given that, and after watching your YouTube videos on how to start a blog, I created a forum that discusses the process I have gone through to uncover all the information I found. Of course, I do talk about the many failures because that is such an important part of the story as well. He says, over the years, I've tackled genealogy from a different perspective, that of looking at my great-grandpa Hugh Breeding's trucking company. At first, I merely intended on putting together some basic facts and figures on the company and calling it a day. However, I have really gotten into the history of the company and the place it held in the trucking industry. Additionally, I've been stepping outside of my own breeding family to interview other families that worked at the trucking company. That has been the real challenging bit because the company was sold in 1972 and many employees have since passed away. Often when conducting the interviews, you find yourself talking to a widow, children, and even sometimes a grandchild. Nevertheless, the employee vignettes featured throughout my company research really drives home the story of the company on a more personal level, as well as adding much more color to the overall history of the firm. Looking back, what was once a simple chapter in my family history book a few years ago has now evolved into a chapter that encompasses over 200 pages just by itself. My family still finds a lot of time to continue researching our breeding roots, but the company sleuthing has taken on a life of its own. Well, thank you, Brett, for sharing your your blog, uh, No Hoof Left Behind. Uh, I really enjoyed it. In fact, I enjoy, there's a blog post. It's called Fanaticism and a Little Luck that I really enjoyed that you did. And one of the suggestions I sent to Brett in response to his email was to check out Google Books. And sure enough, a quick little um, search using Google search strategies that we teach here uh, on the show and in my book, uh, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, brought up that trucking company. So there were books that mentioned um, Hugh Breeding's trucking company, and I think that's a great place to start. Uh, and so I sent those over to him as well. And of course, you can find uh, Google Books at books.google.com. But how fun to really not only focus on the ancestor, but to really get into the context of the the company in general. I, I imagine that Brett's work is actually going to be meaningful to a lot of families. Can you imagine how nice it would be to be doing some research like he's doing and come across a work from another genealogist who did all those interviews and, and collected all that great information. Pretty great stuff. Okay, well, coming up next, we're going to hear from some more of you, those that I met at Who Do You Think You Are Live in London. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning and I bet he's glad For more than any other A line from my old mother Bring me a letter from my home I've got some great news for all you genealogists out there. Roots Magic 6 is now available and it offers some of the most customer requested features like online publishing, the ability to search every record, not just people, an editable timeline view, which is really incredible, 
and new web tags, which lets you link people, sources, places, and research log items to web pages, plus dozens of other great enhancements, and of course, all the built-in features that you've come to enjoy. There is a little something here for everyone. Now, if you're already a devoted Roots Magic user like I am, or if you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and finally start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've just been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, there's no better time to get your copy of Roots Magic 6. Do it now. Go to rootsmagic.com and download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 6. You'll see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. are live in London, but you're not from London. Tell us where you're from. Hi, I'm actually from Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. I'm a local and family history librarian, and um, I've actually been awarded a scholarship to come over here and uh, and find all the things that I can find out here at Who Do You Think You Are Live, and, and I'm visiting libraries and archives as well to just uh, explore how they do it over here and what kind of... Um, tricks and tips <laughs> I can take home that we can sort of put in place in our public library services, yes. Now, I remember when you were applying for the scholarship, you were asking me about, you know, maybe which conferences might be good, and, and certainly, who do you think you're always top on your list? What do you think of it so far? Oh, it's just amazing. Oh, I've been to a few conferences in Australia, but they're hardly, they're not as this big. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually quite overwhelming to try and cover it all because we've, I've been trying to do all the talks, not well, which I can't because okay. there's four streams. But I did check out your talk yesterday on iPads, which was oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, you soon you stop to talk to somebody and they're there asking how can they help. And so you're there for 20 minutes talking about Yorkshire, Cornwall. Um, it's all very inspiring. And it's just terrific to see that it's still vibrant and people are excited about family history and there's lots out there to discover all the time. Absolutely. And there's a wide range of ages here, which always surprises me. And uh, you were talking about going in and being able to chat with people in a booth and get some actual help. I think that's one of the big differences that I've seen between this conference and one of the, a lot of the ones you'll see in the U.S. Okay. is that interactivity. They really kind of get hands-on here, don't they? They do, they do. And they, they, they want to know your personal connection to Yorkshire or Cornwall. Or, so then you have to start tell them your names and you, you know, you've got to quickly get it out of your head yeah. you know, where, you, where your interest is. So do you have British ancestors as well? I do, and, and a lot of Australians do yes, I'm, I'm actually a fifth generation Australian with convict heritage on one side of my family line. So it's this really is the roots for a lot of Australians when they're doing their family history. Exactly. So do you know which county we're here in the um, the Society of Genealogists section of the Expo Hall, which is about the size of a football field? Um, do you know which county, and have you been over there and kind of checked it out? Well, we're just across from Yorkshire, and um, so I've been talking to them over there. Um, I've got Robert's family in Yorkshire, and then they're actually just opposite to Cornwall here, Cornwall Family History Society, and I have Stevens. And so Roberts and Stevens are both very common names. Right. Uh, and my husband has White. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, you really do have to drill down to the detail and the place yes. the place and the time period that you're looking for. Um, but I think the other thing, too, is I'm taking home a lot of resources to look at. It's not just the websites. You know, they have lots of material that you can purchase, and so I've got to look into all of that as well. So, lots of homework. Yeah, you're going to have a lot of work to do. You, you said that you um, were able to sit in on several of the classes, and I know a lot of them were just overflowing. What was one of your big takeaways, your aha moments yesterday or the day before? 
actually the uh, the effort being made to preserve the information on war memorials. Yes. And I think that's that's happening because of the lead up to the World War One centenary. And so encouraging people to look at their own local war memorials and actually, you know, they, they aren't just obelisks, you know, they take different forms. There's indoor honour rolls and different kinds of war memorials. And I think that's something I'd like to look at when I go home as to what's been happening with our war memorials. So that was good. I went to a talk on uh, gravestonephotographs.com, I think the website's called. Uh, and it's just one individual. Uh, he's retired and he's just encouraging everyone to take photographs of gravestones, send them into his website and he'll have them there and and he's just encouraging everyone to do this because gravestones deteriorate ancient, you know, they're getting older and older, especially in this country. So that was inspiring. There's lots. And you've got lots more to go. It's uh, We're only just part way through Sunday, but and then what, where are you off to for your next conference? Uh, so I'm here for I'm here in London for another couple of weeks. I'm going to visit the National Archives, the Society of Genealogists, and then you, then I fly out to New York, um, and going to see the New York Public Library and the National Archives in New York City. They're on everybody's dream tour. <laughs> then I'm going to Fort Wayne, Indiana, to the Genealogy Centre there, and I'm actually doing a talk for them on Australian genealogy and how to find your Americans in Australia. Then, then yeah, then to Salt Lake City um, for Roots Tech, and then home via San Francisco. So we'll see each other again. We will. I look forward to it. How fun to meet you in person. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Lisa. My name is Kleena Bikjelehada. And it's a lovely name, and it's one that when I get an email from you, I spot it, I go, oh, there she is, and tell us where you're from. I'm from County Waterford in Ireland, and uh, Bikjelehada is the Irish for McGillicuddy, which is a County Kerry name. It's my married name. My own surname is Nick Burrahu, otherwise known as Murphy. I was just talking with somebody else today. We were talking about Irish research and how we think, oh, simple, it's an English-speaking country, but there are surnames, like you say, that literally have to be translated, and so you could be looking through a, a church record and not realize you are looking at your surname because it's been it's in Irish. Absolutely. Um, the English translations were always done phonetically. Nobody sat down to decide that McGillicuddy was big but you can have five or six English versions of the one Irish surname. So the fact that your ancestor is Neil or O'Neill or whatever, they were O'Neill in Irish. So you've really got to think about how the name sounded and maybe take advice on how it sounded originally in Irish even. So you don't want to just do this at first glance. You really need to consult also with an expert, somebody who could really make sure that you, you've covered the base. Yes, because people can get hung up on, oh, our family spell their name with an E at the end or not. Not really relevant in Irish genealogy. You, you have to cast the net a little bit wider than that, where surnames are concerned anyway. Fantastic. And you've come down, is this your first time, to, or have you been here many times before? No, this is my first time coming to London. Um, for First time for the show. Um, I just decided that I would like to see what all the hype was about. I was able to organise a few days off, so I've come for the three days, and it's uh, it's huge. It's any it's bigger than anything I've ever been at before. Really good. Met a lot of interesting people and uh, a lot of good talks, tutorials, and so on. Yeah, they've, they've expanded their talks this year. This is my third year here, and I and I'm pleased to see them really adding on the education. In fact, the classes here have been overflowing. Um, is has there been a class that you've been to so far where you just walked away and went, oh, okay, I got an aha moment, you know, something I can use when I get home. 
Um, well, I went to a tutorial or a, a class on online maps yesterday, which was really, really good. And the other uh, big favourite of mine is the Registry of Deeds in Dublin. And uh, there was a talk yesterday on the Registry of Deeds, which was uh, just brilliant for me, uh, because it's a very little-known source. But if you do find something there, it has so much potential, so much um, genealogical information. It's basically a huge, big, old building that was set up in 1708 in Dublin. And they've got memorial copies actual copies of deeds going back to the 1700s but it's very difficult to access and um, you know you need to spend a bit of time there so it was a really really useful lecture for me yeah oh, fantastic um, any other classes that you've you've come across um, oh god so so many I can hardly think the other one that really blew my mind was one on DNA that I listened to um, I think his name was Michael Hammer from Family Tree DNA and he spoke about the, the deep ancestral origins with the result that I've gone this morning and I've done a DNA test my first oh, ever so. so how long will you need to wait to get your results a few weeks I believe yeah they email you back out and uh, you get your login details and uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's so nice to meet you in person and hear your, your lovely voice, get your voice on the podcast here and um, have a great rest of the show. Lisa, likewise, and um, I always listen to your podcasts and I did catch some of your talks here, but as you know, they were sold out a long time ago, so I got them from the periphery. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Lisa, and really nice to meet you in person for the first time. You are live that sold out almost immediately was that of Dr. Turi King, the geneticist from the University of Leicester, who had the unique opportunity to conduct the DNA testing on the remains found under a Leicester parking lot, or car park as it's referred to in the UK, that were suspected to be that of none other than King Richard III of England. Dr. Turi King is currently working as a Welcome Trust postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Genetics at the University of Leicester, carrying out further work on the link between surnames and DNA. She obtained her first degree in biological anthropology at the University of Cambridge before moving into the field of molecular genetics. She was awarded her PhD in November 2007 from the University of Leicester Department of Genetics. Her thesis was entitled the relationship between British surnames and Y chromosomal haplotypes. This mother of four is a very busy lady, and following her talk at Who Do You Think You Are Live, after the crowds finally thinned, Turi and I had the opportunity to sit down one-on-one. -on -one. I was particularly anxious to meet with her, as a couple of years ago, her colleague at the University of Leicester, Dr. Marcus Cook, arranged for her to conduct DNA testing on my husband. You see, Dr. Marcus Cook and my husband Bill are distant cousins, sharing a third great-grandfather, which Dr. King confirmed. In this excerpt from our conversation, we talk about the discovery and DNA testing that led to Richard III's identification. Well, I'm here in the staff lounge of Who Do You Think You Are Live with Dr. Turi King from the University of Leicester. What's so funny is when Richard III all came to light and I'm reading the articles, what stuck out for me was Dr. Turi King. Yes. And I recognize the name because you ran the DNA on my husband a couple of years ago as part of the Cook study. So, so nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> so you're here talking about, obviously, this discovery that is 
taking over the world, it seems like, about now. And let's, let's just go back real quickly to the beginning, because I know for so many people interested in genealogy, and that's why you're here too, DNA is it still a bit of a mystery, even though I think there's more and more information about it. It can be a, a bit muddled after a while. So let's go back to the beginning of how you got tied into this see if we can find the remains that I'm sure you had to identify a site I was surprised how early on you were involved yeah. and I guess that makes sense because you were going to deal with what they were bringing out so talk yeah. about that well so as I say Richard Buckley um, contacted me and said that there would be a possibility of doing a dig looking for um, the Greyfriars monastery but that's where Richard III was thought to have been buried um, Philippa Langley of the Richard III Society had contacted him um, and had asked him to sort of make up a plan of where they might do excavation. So because we had a female line descendant, Richard contacted me back in 2011 to see whether or not I'd be interested in, in trying to do the, the DNA side of it. So this has been in the works for a while. Yeah, well, it went quiet for a while. And then um, last August, uh, we suddenly got the go-ahead. Um, so I think it was money raised by the Richard III Society, but also by the University of Leicester and Leicester City Council, and all came together. And so the dig started um, on the 24th of August, with the trenches going in on the 25th of August of last year. Wow. Yeah. And so things really, I imagine, snowballed after that. Yeah. We, as I say, we, we came across the skeletal remains on the very first day, uh, but you have to get a license to lift them. It was the long weekend, and so it took a little while. So in the meantime, we're doing our trenches, and we're working out where we are. Um, and, and then, obviously, yes, started excavating the skeletal remains, and um, it was Joe Appleby who lifted uh, them and, and obviously came across... Uh, somebody with severe head injuries, severe scoliosis of the spine in the part of the church where we think he's supposed to be. And uh, that was on the 5th of September. So I, I, I confess what happened was I was doing, helping excavate on the 4th and then we didn't get to complete the skeleton. We only did it up to sort of his, well, a bit of his waist really. Mm -hmm. And then Joe was excavating the following day, and I texted her from Innsbruck, where I'd gone for a forensic conference, and I texted her and said, so how's our 90-year-old friar? And she said, uh, actually, um, male, young, head injuries, uh, severe scoliosis of the spine. I thought she was joking. <laughs> So I actually ended up um, ringing Matt, who was the sort of site director, saying, um, oh my goodness, uh, could you please, you know, just put things into clean bags and we'll take samples under clean conditions and um, we'll, yeah. And we were all quite stunned. We never in a million years thought we would find him. And there you were in Innsbruck. It must yeah. have been like some, you know, your sister having a baby in another country. That's I mean, right. you just want to run back. And it's, and it's really important, as you were talking about how old these skeletal yeah. remains are, uh, you can't just go picking them up. No. Tell us about how contamination plays a role in yeah. all that. Yeah, okay, so the thing with ancient DNA is the DNA is heavily degraded, so there's not very much of it left. What's there is in very small pieces. So the DNA that you've got, there's lots of it and it's in very long pieces and uh, so if you are breathing on it or touching it or anything like that you're, you're depositing your own modern DNA onto the skeletal remains and when you run the experiments the experiments are just going to amplify a bit of DNA that you're you're interested in, but it doesn't know whether or not you're interested in the ancient DNA or the modern stuff. So it will, it will preferentially, because there's so much more of the modern DNA around, if you've been touching it, it will preferentially amplify up that and not the ancient DNA, which is what you're actually trying to get a hold of. So we had to work under really clean conditions. Poor Jo was double gloved. This was in August. So she was in this full-on white suit with the face mask and the double gloves. And um, yeah, so I hear she was absolutely roasting while she was lifting the skelly. Yeah. And, and I imagine, even though the the remains were in such good condition, I would think, for yeah. as many years yeah. old as they were, and you were fortunate enough that he would happen to have these very distinct characteristics. Yeah. Um, so you, you've got that, but really you weren't taking DNA from bones. You were focusing on teeth, yeah. just like you hear about today. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the reason why you go for teeth is they tend to be the best preserved. They're much easier to clean. Bone is porous, um, whereas teeth, it's much easier to clean them. So yes, it was, the teeth are basically the, the bit of the, of the remains that you go for if you want to get ancient DNA as a, as a sort of priority, really. 
I mean, it's just a small sample. There's an amplification process, so you're kind yeah. of remultiplying it just to what build up the sample and up to test. Yes, that's right. I mean, it, so there's there's not very much of it. The um, sort of equipment and things that you you use, you need to have multiple copies of it to be able to for it to actually register. So you go through a process where you make copies of the DNA that's there, essentially. So they they collect the DNA. You, you've got this. Uh, you told the story of trying to <laughs> transport a tooth. Now I heard a rumor. Did did uh, Dr. Cook have something to do with helping you figure out how to transport remains across the country line boundaries? <laughs> I did talk to him about it because he's our ethics officer and so I explained to him about how I'm going to have to be traveling with this tooth and I wasn't sure whether or not to just try and, and go through customs and hope that, you know, what's, what's the best way to deal with it? Is it best to kind of say, look, I'm traveling with a tooth or is it best to just have it in your luggage? So he was very sweet and talked me through about how it's probably best to just fess up at the front <laughs> <laughs> and say this is what you're doing and then he was absolutely right. Instead of commit the deed and ask forgiveness later I mean <laughs> well it's more I wasn't sure where even you know do I put this in my luggage do I keep it with me I mean it's such a precious thing as I say short of my my children I have never been so worried about dropping or losing an item in all of my life so in the end I actually literally had it in my jacket inside of my jacket pocket um, just sort of stuck to me nearly the entire trip. and of course the reason that you were having to take it um, out of yeah. Great Britain, and you were taking it overseas because ancient DNA testing is, is even different. I assumed you had done it on your own lab. No, oh goodness, no. Well, so the, the problem is, is when you when you go through this process and you're making copies of the DNA, when you're working in a modern lab and you're making copies of DNA, that those copies are still around in the lab. So it means that that's another contamination source. So if I'm trying to copy a particular bit in the skeletal remains, and there's a possibility of there being that same piece of DNA. DNA that's been copied in another person that could then contaminate your experiment. So you have to work in dedicated ancient DNA facilities. And and so the ones that I, I went through were, were University of York, Michael Hofreiter, and one um, with Patricia Balarask in Toulouse, who's an old friend who they happen to have a, an ancient DNA lab down there. So it was great. I got to see her and go and do this project. So You call her up. Oh, I just yeah. happened to have an ancient DNA lab. <laughs> well, so you run the DNA. Now, just real quickly, give us an idea of the time frame. So you've got the remains. You go to the lab. Uh, what time frame are we talking about and how quickly you could actually get results? You must have been on pins and needles. Oh, it was it was terrible. I couldn't even get to the labs until December. Oh. Yeah, so we found the remains on the 5th of September and then it's a case of organizing with labs, um, setting up contracts. We want to be able to pay them for any any reagents and things that they're using. I have to slip into their, their lab schedules essentially. So I didn't even get into the first one until the middle of December. And then the second one in January. So it's a case of working working extremely quickly because by that point we knew we probably wanted to announce in February. So it was getting to the point where I was happy with the results that they won't change. It's not everything that I'm, I want to, to, to get finished in that time. It's very difficult because the amount of pressure from the media actually was wow. was huge because um, of course they think it's like CSI and you're just going to be able to just, oh this will be no problem. <laughs> it happens overnight, That's right? right. Yeah, I mean, you know, Jeremy Kyle <laughs> show type yeah. stuff. Where, you know, it'll be no problem, we'll do this in a few hours. Um, and the little print out will come out on a computer with, with just yes or no. But it's, I mean, it really, really isn't like that. It takes time. So um, we decided to go for the February thing, and then I was just working extremely hard to get it done in that time. And trying to keep a secret. Yeah, trying to keep a secret. I mean, not, not even my husband knew. I didn't tell him until the, the weekend before. Um, we I have four children, so we couldn't talk about it in the house in case they go to school and say something. And certainly parents were apparently asking my children if there was any news. <laughs> trying to get the That's to right, it. exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Working very, really, really quick. I went into sort of a media blackout the week before as, as I was mas madly kind of analyzing the data ready to go for the Monday. So, yeah. So bring us into your lab, and you're printing out results, yeah. and you're starting to see little squiggles that are yeah. color-coordinated. <laughs> what, what was that like? I mean, this well, is not just any DNA test. No, no. So the, the results come back. You get them as a computer file, so you open them up on your computer screen, and then you uh, basically uh, align the sequence, and you're doing it in short fragments. So the first fragment came back, and that was a match, and then I did another one, and I was matching that one, and then it was just slowly kind of building up all of the sequence, and I, I, I did. I mean, the first one came back, and it was a match. I just went, 
Oh my goodness. It was like the first hint. I mean, I still didn't know for sure, obviously, but it was just a first hint that maybe this was going to be a match. And then certainly by, um, you know, very end of January, first sort of bit of February, I was happy. Yeah, it's wow. a match. We can go with this. And um, yeah, I, so the people on the team didn't even know until the Sunday. So the archaeologists, uh, Joe Appleby, um, Richard Buckley, Lynn Fox, so none of them knew until the Sunday. They weren't all camping outside your no. office door. <laughs> they were really sweet. They're like, please don't tell me because they were having so much pressure from the press. People were, were talking to them and they were so worried that they would give any results away. And, and I was literally still working right up to the wire. So uh, they, they were very sweet and said, please don't tell me how it's going because we don't want to accidentally blab it. <laughs> I do not want to go down in history as the one. <laughs> well, as you can hear, Dr. Turi King is a fascinating woman, and we got to spend a lot more time together than what we've heard here today. If you would like to hear our conversation in full, where Turi goes on to talk about the role that DNA can play in learning more about your own family history. You can hear it in its entirety in the upcoming Genealogy Gems premium podcast episode number 97. Thanks for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 152. If you uh, want any information about things we've talked about here on the show, head to the show notes, go to genealogygems.com, click on podcast episodes in the menu, and navigate your way to episode 152. And be sure and check out my two new articles in the March-April 2013 issue of Family Tree Magazine. I've got two there for you. One of them is Evernote versus Microsoft OneNote. It's a quick guide. And also there's a toolkit tutorial. It's called Using the David Rumsey Map Collection. Now, if you have followed anything I've done on Google Earth for Genealogy, then you know that's one of my favorite websites for historical digitized maps. They're all available for free. you got to check it out. And this article will walk you through step-by-step how to use the David Rumsey Historic Map Collection. And I also cover that, uh, talk about it in my Google Earth for Genealogy DVD series. You know, I just did a webinar as soon as I got back from London. In fact, I did it for um, the Southern California Genealogy Society Jamboree Webinar Extension Series. And we did time travel with Google Earth. And I have to tell you, I was really excited about doing that webinar. And I was really nervous about it because it was brand new. It was going to mean I had to be live on Google Earth while we were also running GoToWebinar. Thankfully, the bandwidth held up. Everything went really smoothly. And I got a chance to share some projects that I have been working diligently on and really excited about. And they really get just that much closer to that time travel type experience. And I have to say, the feedback and the response was phenomenal. People were going crazy on Facebook and talking about how addicted they had become to Google Earth for Genealogy, and that's music by ears, because I am too. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, if you missed the webinar, got a couple of options. First of all, you can go to genealogygems.com, and under videos, you'll find a free one-hour introductory class called Google Earth for Genealogy. Give you a chance to see what we're talking about. And second of all, Genealogy Gems Premium members, I am very excited to say that the video of the webinar that we did that is no longer publicly available is going to be available to you. So if you want to check out time travel, how you could do that, get that old uh, time travel machine, set the dial back to an ancestor's era, and see what things were like, we do a bit of that in Google Earth. And so that is coming soon to Genealogy Gems Premium. I will uh, let you know in the newsletter when we have a specific launch date for that video. All right, well, thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.